I'm probably a lot like you, an aspiring aquascaper who tries his best but can't help but marvel at how much better others are at creating stunning aquascapes. But I want to change that for both of us. So stick around if you want to know what sets pro aquascapers apart from the algae infested masses and how we can try to bridge the gap. Now this isn't going to be an everything you need to know about aquascaping video, there are plenty of those around. What I want to concentrate on today are the things that pro aquascapers do differently from us mere mortals. And what I mean by this is really the resources and methods that they have available to them which a fish keeper on a budget simply doesn't have. And as we go along I'll try and identify ways that we can account for those differences in affordable and achievable ways. So first up I want to talk about water quality and fertilizers. It is often stated that a fish keeper doesn't really keep fish, they keep water, and that is certainly true. But not all water is created equally. So one of the first things a lot of pro aquascapers will be doing is using reverse osmosis water in their aquariums. Basically they are using a water source that provides a blank canvas, meaning you can methodically control what is added to the water column and be very precise about your dosing. Now I don't want to sound too cynical, but aquascapers that say they get great results straight out the tap without doing anything are definitely a lucky minority. There are so many factors at play with regard to tap water quality, ranging from where you live in the world, the agricultural policies of your country, and simply the age and quality of the water pipes and systems that transfer water to your tap. But RO water is not a reality for most of us. Fitting a filter is costly and cumbersome, and then filtering is a timely process and you generally need a large barrel to store the filtered water in, in preparation for water changes. Many local fish shops will also sell RO water at a hefty price. Basically, RO is not going to be an ideal solution for most small scale hobbyists. But there are two key things that anyone can do to somewhat accommodate for variable water quality, both of which involve using water reports to better understand the chemicals in your tap water. Now most water companies are legally obliged to provide this information publicly, but if this isn't available to you, I would suggest reaching out directly to your water company and asking them to provide a report. Or if you really have to, you can conduct some tests of the tap water yourself. The first thing this information will enable you to do is to adjust your fertilizer dosing to accommodate for any spikes in nutrients already coming into your aquarium via the tap. For example, it is very common to see high phosphorus levels leaching from farmland into water sources and even more common to see it in areas with old Victorian era lead pipes where phosphorus is used to stop lead poisoning. And if you know that a chemical is already in abundance, you can avoid adding any more in. And you can do this either by making your own DIY fertilizer and reducing the amount of a certain salt, which I have a great video on by the way, or you can purchase separate fertilizers and reduce the dosing of anything you already have in the tap. Either way, the IFC fertilizer calculator on the UCAPS forum is going to be your friend since it allows you to plug in your water quality reports and work out which fertilizers can be reduced. Again, I talk all about this in my DIY fertilizer video. Basically, what all this knowledge about your water will do is allow you to apply whatever dosing regime you settle upon in an affordable and accessible way. The second thing that knowing more about your tap water will enable you to do is to buffer the water to maintain a consistent pH, hardness and conductivity. Now there are a number of ways you might want to buffer water depending on your specific situation and water buffering techniques range from adding a buffering substrate to the bottom of your tank, adding a chemical buffer within your filter or even natural buffering with things like driftwood and almond leaves. Everyone's situation is going to be different and all of this will take a lot more work and research, but there is absolutely no reason you can't make up for the lack of RO water with just a bit of know-how. Now another thing you will often see pro aquascapers do is massively overfilter their aquariums and the reason they are doing this is to achieve high flow rate and avoid any dead spots where water is not sufficiently circulating. This ensures that detritus is always filtered away and that plants are getting a consistent dose of fertilizer no matter where they are placed in the tank. But from a biological filtration perspective, there is no advantage to having two expensive 25 watt external canister filters fitted to a 200 litre aquarium. It's likely that even one might be overkill and high water flow is not always appreciated by your fish. And obviously most people don't have the resources to run such an expensive filtration setup anyway, which is why I run all of my aquariums in the fish room bar one off of a single 20 watt air pump and a range of under gravel or sponge filters. 
and a tank with well-established bacteria colonies will easily deal with detritus on the tank floor and make any mess safe and ultimately available to your plant roots eventually. And if it's bothering you from an aesthetic perspective, well, that's one more reason to keep on top of water changes and maintenance. But the key point is this. There are many, much cheaper ways to increase flow rate. For example, a cheap free watt aquarium skimmer is a great way of providing additional water flow and mechanical filtration in an air filtered tank. Or indeed, there are things like wave makers that can increase flow rate too. But my main challenge to you would be to explore if you actually need this additional water flow in the first place. With some simple modification to my air powered filters, for example, I have managed to increase water flow via spray bars and have a few other air powered experiments on the horizon that you should keep an eye out for. But yeah, in summary, if you want high flow, there are cheaper ways of achieving it, and it may not always be necessary anyway. A good bit of research will give you further insight into what your fish and plants actually need, and there are a number of ways you can catch up with the pros. Next up, substrate. Something you almost always see a ProAquascaper recommend is a premium aquasoil substrate, but it's important to understand what this is and why it makes sense for them, but not necessarily for everyone. At its core, an aquasoil is a porous baked clay that has a high cation exchange capacity which allows it to store nutrients from the water column and make them available to the roots of aquarium plants. In a pro aquascaper setup, this is desirable because of the high nutrient dosing that is used to achieve rapid growth of plants, essentially turning the substrate into a rechargeable battery for excess nutrients. When balanced with weekly 50% water changes, this can be a really effective way of achieving really quick and beautiful results. But there are two things to consider here. If you're not intending to intensively dose your aquarium with a fertilizer regime like Estimative Index, then you'll want to consider other substrates that have a higher naturally occurring nutrient content from the start, which your plants can slowly access over time. That's why you will see low tech setups experimenting with composts and baked dirt. And so long as you cap them with a decorative sand to avoid excess excess nutrient leaching, they can be a really good option. And equally, if you do want to go down the high-tech route, there are still high cash and exchange capacity options that cost significantly less. For example, there is a vast community of high-tech aquascaping enthusiasts creating beautiful planted aquariums using cat litter as a substrate for this very reason. In fact, I also made a video about this topic and the results of my experiment were fascinating. So expensive aquasoil is not the be all and end all. And depending on what type of approach you intend to take, it might not even be the best solution. All that said, if you want rapid results, then some form of high CEC substrate combined with estimative index is gonna be the quickest way to achieve a luscious planted tank. And this is the main reason that pro aquascapers go down the route of aquasoil. But for the more budget conscious amongst us, patience is key. Another area that you will see an awful lot of debate on is aquarium lighting. Pro aquascapers will often gravitate towards a particular premium brand like Kessel or Twinstar and become huge proponents of a particular light being the key to success. The simple truth is that aquarium lighting has far more to do with aesthetic preferences than it does with any science. Simply put, aquarium plants use light in the 400 to 700 nanometer range to photosynthesize. Given that this is the majority of all visible light, you can rest assured that if your eyes can see it, then a plant can photosynthesize from it. Now, obviously I have massively oversimplified this, and of course, light intensity plays a factor too. But ultimately, if you compare lumens to lumens, a cheap light and an expensive light will provide an identical environment for a plant to grow. The difference will be in the makeup of the light in terms of its RGB balance and the Kelvin rating, and thus a difference in appearance to our human eyes. But rest assured, I grew out my 2021 IAPLC competition tank using a 15 pound Samson LED floodlight and had a lot of fun listing that in the lighting column of my entry form. Another thing that all pro aquascapes will do is dose their tanks with CO2. Now I won't dwell on this too long since I have a whole CO2 buyer's guide on this very topic, but needless to say, CO2 is certainly important for quick and luscious plant growth and essential for some hard to grow species. But equally, there are plenty of easy to grow plants that will survive just fine without CO2 injection. And so as long as you are patient, a CO2 system is not always essential. 
And even if you do go down this path, seriously consider watching my buyer's guide video and finding out about the pros and cons of different systems and when it makes sense to go down the budget DIY route. Now, there are a few things that all pro escapers do that you really can't avoid doing yourself. Firstly, pretty much every aquascaper will recommend that you plant heavily from the very beginning to ensure that plants establish themselves well and outcompete any potential algae. This is definitely a top pro tip and an investment that will pay dividends. If you try and take cuttings and slowly build up your planted tank from just a couple of initial plants, you will invariably meet all kinds of issues and really struggle to keep an algae free tank. So definitely do invest some of the money you've saved on lighting, substrate and filtration to buy lots and lots of beautiful plants which adequately fill your aquarium from the start. Now earlier I also touched upon dosing regimes. You will almost always see a professional aquascaper using a daily dosing regime of a complete range of fertilizer, water reports notwithstanding. Now whether or not you are running a low, medium or high energy setup, some form of daily dosing with weekly water changes is also a method that I would stick to. It means that your plants always have the nutrients they need to grow to their potential and subsequently outcompete algae. The only caveats I would add is that you can make your own complete fertilizer from dry salt really easily and save a lot of cash. And of course there are methods like no filter water tanks that are a completely different ball game when it comes to fertilization. I really must do a proper video about the water method sometime soon. The final thing that you need to keep up with is a regular maintenance routine. In a high-tech planted tank, your plants are going to grow incredibly quickly. And really and truly, whatever route you go down, you need to be keeping up with regular maintenance. On a high-tech, heavily dosed aquarium, this will likely mean conducting a 50% weekly water change. But even on a no-filter, no-water change setup, you still need to keep on top of regular trimming, water top-ups, and the occasional scrubbing of the glass. Maintenance isn't just about aesthetics. It is the moment when you connect with the aquarium and establish what is going on in your delicately balanced little ecosystems. So rest assured that you don't have to have an enormous bank balance to create beautiful planted aquariums, but you may well need to do a bit more research and find a bit more patience. I promise that in the long run, it will pay off. Now that I've got you thinking about all these accessible routes to catch up with the pros, here are a few recommendations depending on what intrigued you the most. For my cat litter substrate video, click the top left card. For my CO2 buyer's guide, click the top right card. For my DIY fertilizer video, click the bottom left card. And for my aquarium lighting guide, click the bottom right card. Take care and I'll see you soon.